Yes. Okay, okay. So, I just wanted to tell you very briefly a little bit about my story and uh, about how I came to the mind for this. Um, so, 24 years ago, more or less, a uh, little bit less, my eldest daughter, the but a tiny baby, and I'm a very busy journalist, really stressed, and you know, I was, I was a single mother, and I, I wasn't really coping. And a friend of mine shared some techniques that I didn't actually know of the mind for this, <laughs> they were. Um, basically about how I could actually carry on doing everything I was doing, but being more in the present moment. Now, we know these days that that's mindfulness, but back then, not many people were talking about it. And it was amazing. I could suddenly really survive, but more importantly, I felt I was really present in if my do it sound. The first time I was thinking about in the ocean, doing my work, we the seat and basic thing. So that, that sort of got me very excited about my interest, and I get practicing for many, many years. But for a very long time, I was a closet meditator. I didn't tell anybody in the business world. I was coaching, I was writing about business. It was a secret that I did this meditation. And I know some of you have had similar experiences. Um, but like, I began to feel more brave about sharing mindfulness in my coaching because I've got a dispenser for me so much. <coughs> I'm proud to then attend my clients. But when I looked around, there wasn't much in the literature set, which is why I was prompted to do the search and the first bit and so on. And of course, nowadays, mindfulness is everywhere and was it brilliant. And the okay, so. So in this, in this talk, I need to draw on some themes of Bronk and my observant think of the two boots and ongoing, and basically around how we can partner up with individuals and organizations to move the middle through challenging times, drawing on wine sense, but in fact, actually. So I don't think part of the setting, you know, relax, everything's under control. Um, well, there's a virgin saying in the chicks to that nothing's under control. And, and I don't know about you, and it may not have actually been true, but certainly I think that's the sense that the both of us had that, you know, I mean, today's the anniversary 9 of ever, isn't it? Um, so with crisis, it's, it seems to be everywhere, challenges and all around. And it certainly thing was that way anyway. And there's an article in Harvard Business Review by Bennett and the morning it's short about the that. Uh, which basically sounds the volatile, unpredictable, complex, and, and, and ambiguous. And, and basically the idea is that, you know, in management circles, we took the use of the term Luther to say, it's crazy out there. And we're, we're always saying, it's crazy, it's crazy out there. So how can we live well with this? And now, when I was doing a search for the second book, I was curious about how this crisis, these challenges, had actually helped us deal with being no voters without the night, or I might say more around rather than time. So my point is to for passion, I know at least some of you um, have, a, have a mind for this practice to do meditation and saying you know a bit about this, but just for those of you who don't, what, what, what is mindfulness and for passion? One definition by Joel Kabat-Zinn has been very instrumental in really that mindfulness is the mainstream. Hey, intention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present element, with non judgments. Okay. So if you think of it really as a way of training our mind, a, a, a way of being, it's a way of being, and it's the set of finding news. Compassion. Um, one definition of those are and I'm the that has been quoted, this very definition is not in the theory in lots of the literature, psychology, it's a general thing. The sensitivity and to the suffering of self and others, which then, which was deep commitment to relieve that. So ever since Art Whitmer, there's this idea that there's an action, that we don't just improvise to take action. Two. So what does it look like, mindful, compassionate coaching? So I'm loosely called to obtain commitment, and think of the tank, man, and us, but it's, it's actually a collection of aspirations, as values, as behaviors. So just to get through those quickly, um, one thing I think is really important to this is to practice developing mindfulness, even passion, making need. Like some of the literature, I mean, some of them search around them is showing with as little as 10 nights they make all the difference. This is from the Ashridge, uh, this is called. And um, so I think that had to go into a case, three months, you can just do five, 10 minutes and we're all busy. So this is quite exciting to realize that we can get away with that. But you know, basically regular practice. Do some training. Now, I never think that's the as there's an AD program in mindfulness you could often do, and there will be all sorts of other training. But just get some input um, around that. And then there's these aspirations, uh, basically non-judgment, compassion. We're really curious. 
being willing to say the not knowing, which is really important these days, and we can't have the answers. You know, we expect our leaders to have all the answers. There's something we really want to talk about. Actually, there was not learning. Accepting um, what's happening, what's emerging, without trying to change it both ways. Working with it before then, and not being anybody attached to our partners. And the other piece for me, which I, I think was really important, is before each coaching session, prepare nicely. Go to the coaching session. If the client who said something has got you all agitated, you can practice one of this in the session. Take a systemic perspective. Now, we know that mind do is helps us be interconnected. So there's this idea that we get many more data, we can work to the system. And reflect in mind for the L3 session. Engage speaking and supervision, but as a mindful play to it, they can be short to both or mindful. And really incumbent in taking time out ourselves to be challenged, to be and a thing to be or walk or whatever it is. Um, so there's a, there's a value to me in combining having mindfulness grounded in bodily wisdom and compassion. Like worst for one in English because it's ABC, but it works with staying in Greek. But this idea that the, the mindfulness has to and so draw on the bodily wisdom. So in the West, we're very good at cutting off here, aren't we? Everything's in our heads. Um, but with mindfulness, we learn how to work with the body to get more information, to get more wisdom. And, and actually, yeah, we to mean, work with that to be more when we fall. And uh, for me, this real um, sense that mindfulness will have to the world together. There's there are two sides of the same coin. So, for example, a sniper in the war could be very mindful, really targeted, a great good at shooting, but they're probably not passing. Probably, maybe they are compassion. Uh, and be passionate on its own, that we could say is to be self pity. We used to be mindful. You will come today and you could have said, No, I'm too tired. It's my first week back at work. I can't be full of That could be self, that could be compassion. But the bottom mindfulness, the awareness, then is found in the map. So I'm thinking back to the, the lotus we were talking about. We're not just focusing on the nuns, whether be it nurturing and they're supposed to be slammed, but the sound in the world. So for all those other nuns. So Fermi and Corpse is obviously in Chatterjee Times is the idea of well-being and there's so much research out there about how mindfulness and increasingly compassion can help us work to become more and more mentally and physically well. We're really keen in coaching and we're seeing a rise in mental health problems all over the world and I think it's no longer okay as coaches to say, well, oh, I don't do problems like that, I only do good stuff. Go away, yeah, because all of our clients, ourselves included, uh, all of us are having some stress. It's not easy. So I think we have to have some ways to work with that. And of course, we have to recognize boundaries, refer on to therapists if need be. Or we can do some work initially. And we know that mindfulness helps us to improve our ability to, to manage threats, violence. And, and it's actually shown to reduce the, the number of sick days taken. So it's really, really key in challenging times. As I say, more and more we're seeing search of the passion. The passion helps people stand up searches and they'll see, they'll hurt, boosting trust, is boosting well-being. And we're seeing a lot more organisation was recognising that, I think. And well, yeah, Sis and and Beverage have done some work where they showed that if you had news, compassion, and hedging, it actually helps not only boost health and well-being, but it brings more change and it helps get the change in place. And pull some care for the which we can't look out to other people, we can't work with other people for less we give the off ourselves. So in addition to sharing techniques with clients for well-being, we need to be able to do this up to get these. So just briefly, one, I, I, I worked with the General Housing Association in London, which deports, which, which helps people find houses as under. So it's very stressful the job. The frontline people were in, were in a terrible state, performance at Plumpty, and we also had a combination of hopefully with mindfulness, mindfulness training, of complex indication. And as you can see there, there are great improvements in stress management, communication relationships, work there to work the cactus days and work life plans. With, with those, there's more case studies coming through about the impact of, of my own unit. You don't. So, attending to, we know that learned a Greek. Attending to relationships. Um, the project, which some of you would have heard of, carried out by Google over two years, Project Aris Software. 
and I'm subbing for pages to USA. And we showed that the most important thing in high performing teams was psychological safety. So we're talking about things like trust. And we know from the research that mindfulness and compassion are brilliant at losing the pants <laughs> and psychological safety. So it makes sense to me for all of us working organizations, particularly in challenging times, that we bring some mindfulness and compassion and to actually bring about change to this area. So we see with use collaboration, psychological safety, connectivity, ethics, uh, double values, etc. And as I said before, more and more research coming through on the medium catches than cash them. I don't know about here in case that compassion and improvisations sometimes there's a bit of resistance, but actually it's been shown to have a real, real impact in terms of relationships. Rosie Carl, about uh, contempt developed a compassionate work index that we can actually measure the individuals and the organizations uh, led us compassion. And one thing to say is we're not talking about soft love, we're talking about tough love. Muscular compassion is what the Dalai Lama calls it. So we can still be compassionate, but set boundaries. And I think that's really important. So a lot of organizations don't want to talk about emotions. And even some clients, or even some coaches that we're so far with but emotions have gotten so important um, in times of change, but anyway, and I think what we see is that if organizations ignore emotions, there's a real danger of their inhibiting progress, culture change, all the rest of it. So in times of transition, emotions are often buried under the carpet. But we know that mindfulness can help us work on emotions, uh, foster a of what we might call connection emotions, something like that, and that bus thing. Um, so very important with the endings, it was work with the conventions. So not ignoring it all. So to organisation is going to a time of transition, first for main for clients, whatever word they're, where they're using. Um, they have to, we have to support the people going through this transition. But by the loss, the loss of role, the loss of whatever, whatever's going off to them. Otherwise, it won't work. It will all come crashing down. And my thing is really useful there because it was a pause, this process. The neutral zone, the emotion can be seen as emotional wilderness, so it's not neutral at all. It's actually can be quite headedged and it's where all the realignment takes place. Very important to support uh, people in that in that at that stage because that's when a formalization could lose a lot of people. Okay. And that's and that's lovely working, whatever process is happening. And obviously in new beginnings it's about working with around the struggling. And again, to work to create a safe space in which this can happen, drawing on like this, think passion. Thank you. Okay. So I've been talking with about certain tools and months, and do you think of the next style I've found, and it is important when it have been these typical kind, extremely important. But I want to say also that, uh, that mindfulness is brilliant in terms of boosting performance. Now, I, I know I did understand most of it, but Angela has talked about how th- and cognitive flexibility is becoming more important there at the World Economic Forum. So for mindfulness, so much research about how mindfulness helps us perform better, helps us think more flexibly, make more make quicker decisions, more rational, more strategic thinking, more, um, and access to main data. We're tuning into what's going on to our entire body, and we're getting used to being aware that we can skim more information from ourselves, from the limb grounders, from the system. So we're bound to be better able to perform. Now, we could go to overdrive, or because we get these as transities for mindfulness, we can process, we can manage ourselves, can manage our relationships with others. Also associated with creativity and innovation. Now, in times that I didn't like times, that always says that, because people get tunnel vision, then we're about risk. You know, if we bring in mindfulness, then we may maybe then in this environment tradition and still be creating. We can be flexible, we can be adapting. If you please slow down to memory capacity, so if we think in computer, it just means that well, we've got more space on the computer, which again goes out the window when kind of chan within time. So none of the reasons why as coaches, it's particularly in challenging times we should be drawing our online to this and compassion. The king for sorry, but a lovely lady that I sent a view of iron. Um, another thing to say is, as I mentioned earlier, about mindfulness helping as a tent to the system. And I think 
opinion, it's increasingly what we see in our country worse that we don't, but still would be individual, we try and take into account the system. Now, back in, back in, I forget when, I wasn't around at that time, but back in the days when we had mining in the UK, uh, the mine with the miners that go into the mine near the canary, and then there's little yellow birds in the cage. And if the canary started looking a bit wobbly or, or died, it was time to get out of the mine because it was showed that there was, it would be a sign that there were toxic gases. And so not to see this in our Pope shame, but we'll be dealing with an individual when it's difficult times in their organisation. Uh, and the individual is this, like a sign of what's going on, on now square in the organisation. And it's really important, as a lot of the time, the organisation will say, well, that's just Joe, he's used to this. Now, he used to be good, but you know what? He's terrible these days, he just can't do it anymore. But as coach, we need to be alert to that. We need to create that space, a mindful, compassionate space where we can support that individual who's going to review to proper time, but also feedback in a mindful, compassionate way to the organisations to say, look, you know, Joe is actually a sign of what's happening. Um, the other thing I think is that sometimes we, we have to look a very good coach which what the client is not telling us. So if we were as, as coach using mindfulness and compassion to be a better instrument, using our song as an instrument, then we'll be picking up much more of what they're not selling. I need what else is done on this site. But things fall apart is why the school to lay around, doesn't it? Primitive dynamics. So we're all back to being, you know, all of our different roles back in the, back in the day at school, which should clearly quite, can be quite messy, quite okay. So really important to have self-care for us as coach and to be able to support the client and to open up the wider organisation with compassion. Um, because actually, we do need to pull them up. We have to have tough love, that muscular compassion you took to that. Can't get it, let him get away with him. And then in terms of the system, um, mindfulness helps. So we have the inspiration and it does help be more curious, be more open to possibilities, more comfortable with ambiguity and not knowing. So we're just going to be like as a, a window of, of, of possibilities, which is what we want in terms of helping the system be able to measure the measure of eye with sign. And um, still a couple of last things. Um, when we have challenging times, we feel more vulnerable, don't we? And we often think of vulnerability as a weakness. I know I'm, I'm running all of the weedy material of one of the books is Brene Brown, and I'm really glad because she's my heroine, one of them. Uh, so I just wanted to say something about that. Vulnerability is not weakness, it's about a willingness to show up and be seen when you can't control the outcome. It's an, oh, the latest measure of courage, you've earned place, we still think the innovation and change. So it's, it helps us, it's good, it's good for us to be in touch with our mobility. And mindfulness and self-compassion be made with us to be heard or in touch with on every city. And one last thing, I'm sure, I'm hoping that the employers, the organisations that are represented here today would agree that it's not all about productivity, performance, <coughs> all the rest of it. It's actually about bringing back the joy, I think. And to be happy, we're allowed to be happy at work as well. It's been shown to, to boost performance anyway. But I think for me, the greatest gift I've got from mindfulness and compassion is that I feel so much happier than I ever did for some.